Good evening, everyone. How are you? Oh, only one person is good. Is that? Ooh, try that again. How are you? Re- reassure me in the current climate. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be in your company this evening and in such a wonderful place and on such a fantastic occasion with a great purpose to it. Um, I'm just thinking that it's very likely that there are numerous deceased members of the HIST, um, some with very famous names and stellar careers, um, who are revolving in their graves at the thought of this gathering, marking the publication of uh, the College Historical Society's 250-year narrative with this wonderful book, this remarkable tome which is so readable, and with the fabulous exhibition. Um, The reason I think that they could be revolving in their graves probably is because, um, well, that is being launched by a woman who also happens to be the Chancellor of the University, uh, given that the HIST resisted for 200 of its 250 years the admission of women to membership. Um, <laughs> possibly even more shocking to some of them might be the fact that when um, the history of the HIST was to be commissioned, it was a UCD graduate who was asked, <laughs> who was commissioned to write the history. Also, I have to say, a Trinity professor. Um, and those who chose the eminent Patrick Gagan uh, to undertake what has to have been a fascinating but also a very laborious task, uh, they chose well, uh, because he is an absolutely first-rate storyteller, um, and the Hist has any number of stories that are worth telling. So Patrick has written an outstanding narrative of an outstanding phenomenon, the Hist itself. Um, first student university debating society in the world, we claim, Um, where if we um, look at the, um, we've heard about the meticulous meticulous archives, but um, its archives are sometimes rather casually and sometimes meticulously strewn with a litany of famous and infamous names that soar across um, all others and above all others and right across the very convoluted chronicle um, of Irish history. Uh, their lives, their times, their passions, their prejudices come to life um, in these pages, I have to say, with a colour and a flair that makes this a book you simply you can't put down, you don't want to put down. It's also, I think, very timely that we have this publication uh, with its focus on the power um, and the value of intense debates, of discussion, persuasion and oratory, um, at what we might describe, I think rightly, as another watershed moment in Irish history. And that we do have this work, and that we have this wonderful exhibition, but that we do have this book, um, is thanks to the support of the Trinity Trust, uh, the editorial skills of Ross Hines, the publishers, Hines and the Lilliput Press, um, but ultimately, the formidable forensic flair of the author, and of course, the genius of our archivists and our historians here. In this week that is dedicated to the HIST, um, so many of its famous members, speakers, debates and dramas, they've already been called back to memory. And um, I think anybody who has had the chance to see the wonderfully um, evocative and excellently curated exhibition, um, now along with the book, um, will know what a parade of retrospection now is available to a much wider and a, and a contemporary audience. The great thing about this book, of course, is that it brings us right up to contemporary names, uh, from, from right from the, the far reaches of the past to today. I have to say, everybody's going to have their favourite story, of course they are, uh, but my favourites are the seminal role played by doc- Dr Michael Carney, um, an ancestor of President Barack Obama, um, in the foundation of the HIST in 1770 and the equally seminal role played by uh, the Society's treasurer, County Down man Robert Ross, uh, in 1812, um, who was responsible, of course, for the burning down of the White House, uh, mercifully before (laughs) Barack Obama arrived, obviously. Um, And um, I don't know if James Hoban had any relationship with the HIST or with Trinity, but it is interesting that Ross, in burning down the White House, which had been um, essentially built or designed by an Irishman, created work for James Hoban in the redesigning and the rebuilding. So there was a benefit to Ireland both ways, I would have thought. Um, also, I passed the Ross Mo- Monument uh, just outside Rostrever very often, and believe me, it's still keeping people in work. Um, 
I won't attempt to paraphrase at all or describe the legendary theatrics of the Hist or the cast of Dramatis Personae who were involved in its debates, its excommunications, its splits, dissolutions, friendships, enmities, rows, ructions, pushes, shoves, punches, its tragic deaths, its injustices, its fallow times, its spectacular times. Um, as David McConnell has observed, you could not make it up. Um, <laughs> But two perspectives, I think, help us to understand that it wasn't just um, a transitory, superficial, elitist talk shop, but it was a place of real encounter, usually with the terrified self. Um, in his poem, Hist, commissioned for this occasion, uh, former Hist star and dazzling international poet, uh, Michal O'Shale, whom we welcome here with his wife, Christina, here, uh, he describes it as the arena where we found our feet, and everybody, anybody who ever spoke in the Hist will know exactly what that means. It echoes the words of Marianne Elliott in her work in Wolf Tone when she said of it that historically it was the training ground for almost all the leading political figures in the age of Grattan's Parliament. But frankly, you could pick any age in the last two and a half centuries. And you could probably pick any field. And the same could be said, not just of politicians, but of writers, poets, philosophers, lawyers, activists of all sorts, and many others. Because it was the pulpit, it was the platform, it was the bear pit. It is Ireland's Hyde Park corner, a missile launch pad for ideas and theories, notions, beliefs, the greenhouse where the seeds of the future were sown and grown. It was the glass house where stones were thrown, sometimes thrown back. Um, it was the place where shapes were thrown, reputations made, reputations unmade. It was a war zone, but the ammunition was words, opinions, challenges, exhortations, deprecations, incantations. It was the battleground from which men and more latterly women took their bruised or their flattered egos. It was, importantly, the field hospital where ner nerves were cauterised and steel was put in spines and wobbly legs were steadied, where people developed the thick skin that you need to endure the public gaze. It unblocked the dry throats, the choked throats. It let the words flow. In the hist, people who rose to speak often died a thousand deaths, um, but as Mee Hall said, they found their feet. And at the hist debates, a thousand weird ideas were floated, touted, they were disputed, they were discounted, of course, unless they involved the equality of women. Um, a thousand good ideas you know, were skimmed um, like stones in a flat pond surface, they rippled out into city, into community, into country, taking their time to germinate, including in the Hist itself. Decades before Ireland's laws opened up to things like women's rights, gay rights, reproductive rights, divorce, these issues were debated and disputed long and hard on the floor of the Hist. And they fed minds, they helped to open minds, and in time, they let the future in. So in this book, this wonderful book, there is an accessible treasure trove of talent, of once unknown names who were to become legends, of speeches that were average and speeches that were magnificent, of Ireland moving through the generations, changing, changing, talking, talking, slowly becoming the Ireland imagined by so many past heroes and heroines, morphing into this intriguing, wealthy, egalitarian, multicultural European Republic it is today. And if the Hist seems to have, as it does in its early days, um, an obsession with rules and laws, like God, they're like canon lawyers, um, <laughs> rules and regulations, um, if it seems a little bit arcane, and actually it does, and precious, it's actually worth remembering that in its rules and protocols, its procedures and practices, that's in a way what allows the archivist to say of the archive that it is superb. They took the traditions and the rituals and the event itself seriously. 
and that became the mesh and the meld that gave it its longevity. They helped to make sure that the hist was and remains, however heated be times, what Patrick describes very importantly as a safe space in which to send public messages and advance ideas, helping to advance debate on the major issues of the day. For it's always been about ideas that are fleshed out by the quality of oratory, not cheap demagoguery, though I'm sure there was some of that at times too, um, about the power, but that was always the other people, wasn't it? Um, but about the power of persuasion, not coercion, about listening to contradictory views, about breaking out of echo chambers, testing ideas and opinions with the tools of the intellect, the weapon of the intellect, letting those ideas run so that they either died or they lived on their merits. And so this book is a tour of that very particular history, as is the exhibition. And this evening, I just want to call to memory 13 young men. Don't worry, I'm not going to name them, because I can't remember their names myself. But who met in Trinity one evening in 1770. And they will have put out 13 seats for the first meeting for their small audience. And they wrote the attendees' name in the book. They recorded the event. And they probably didn't record it for posterity for us, but just probably for the next week or the next month. And in very uncertain circumstances, because remember, the university did not, did not welcome the hist. Um, in very uncertain circumstances, they had the courage to open that book that was just then full of blank pages and to start filling them. And so that's what we also gather here tonight to celebrate, the courage of those first 13 uh, I wonder what they would make of this Ireland of ours, this uh, partitioned Ireland where tens of thousands now go to university from every conceivable background. And what would they make of the fact that if you look at some of the debates over the years, even going back 200 years, how familiar some of them would be even today. Yet the truth is there is a new Irish landscape in the making. Um, I think it was probably best articulated in the HIST many years ago. Um, by the greatest orator and Irish statesman of my lifetime, John Hume, um, when, and I remember this particular occasion well, as a mesmerising guest speaker, he drew with words the image of a peaceful pluralist Ireland, a reconciled Ireland, a politically healthy island of Ireland, free from the grip of sectarianism and confessional politics, which had estranged neighbour from neighbour, created injustice, created division. He created this image of this egalitarian island, which would be a sign of contradiction in a world dominated so often by the unhealthy power politics of greed, of sexism, elitism, exclusion, and injustice. Well, Ireland has changed, and Trinity has changed, and the Hist has changed wonderfully from the first debate on the Irish question in 1779. And Michal, in his poem, suggests that we look back with gratitude, and he's absolutely right, how lucky we were and are to have this formidable legacy and to have it documented so brilliantly by Patrick. But I think we can also allow ourselves the indulgence of looking forward with gratitude to the heterogeneous generation that has custody of the future. They are going to be extraordinary. How many languages they will speak, how many cultures they draw from today. Um, yes, hopefully the tomorrow of the hist uh, will be a place that honours fully the open-minded, tolerant character of Henry Duquerry. Did I get his name right? How was he pronounced? Duquerry? Yeah. 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 The founder of the College Historical Society. Not a household name yet, but maybe we, we could maybe start that tonight. Um, because he helped to craft its character. Um, from the outset, as a place that savoured debate, respected all who offered opinions, reserved the right of members to make their own minds up after the issues had been debated and deliberated, and charted also in the book, and it's very important to remind ourselves, charted also in the book, to great effect, is how the hist so often over the years changed its mind, its collective mind about things. So I think we're entitled to say that the hist has found its own feet and its continuing relevance in a much altered word. 
world um, of both college and country. And now it has a job, I think, to do to introduce all of us to the new voices, which will craft the ideas and the discussions that will also shape the new Ireland. Um, I, hope they I hope the exhibition will inspire a lot of them um, to come out from behind the bunker of the blog um, or the triteness of the tweet. Um, and in Lee Hall's words, uh, which I think are wonderful, his very telling words, brazen out the wag and heckler's jeer to become interns in the hothouse of debate. Isn't that a lovely thought? I have to say, reading that, those words the, the, about the hecklers and the jeers, I could feel my own self going back to the first time I spoke and the sea legs wobbling um, underneath me. And that's the great gift that many of us look back on the hist and are grateful for the opportunity, the opportunity to speak, the opportunity to grow in ourselves, to lose the fear of ourselves. That's what we lost, the faith in ourselves, the confidence we got in ourselves. What a wonderful gift that has been to so many. Thank you.